As most of you know, Poison Pen Press is an independent publisher specializing in publishing high quality works in the field of mystery. The company's soul and the engine that drives it are embodied in its editor and publisher. Today we have the privilege of honoring them. Barbara Peters is a lawyer turned librarian turned independent bookseller turned editor. Her contributions to the mystery community are manifold. She has a comprehensive knowledge of the genre. Her eye, or perhaps I should say ear, for which authors to publish is nearly pitch perfect. And her editing skills are formidable in both senses of the word. That is, she inspires awe and admiration while at the same time often scaring the crap out of her editees. <laughs> She's a fair hand at organizing writers' conferences. She knows nearly everyone in the business and is never afraid to speak her mind on anything. <laughs> her husband, Robert Rosenwald, heads up a small but hardworking and talented crew that publishes 50 plus hardcover mysteries a year and an equal number of trade paperbacks. He is a techno whiz, works tirelessly with and in support of his authors, has an outsized sense of humor, and is, I can't think of a better word for it, a real sweetie. <laughs> Barbara and Rob are each a force to be reckoned with. As a team, they are, are, they are extraordinary. It is with great pleasure that I present to you this year's recipients of the Boucherkheim Lifetime Achievement Award, Barbara Peters and Robert Rosenwald. Barbara, I first met you in the early 90s. I was a customer of your store when you had your first store on Main Street in Scottsdale, Arizona. And in 1996, you, Rob, and Susan, your daughter, founded the press. How did your interest in mystery fiction turn into involvement with a publishing venture, especially with regard to putting out new novels as opposed to reprints? Well, we weren't intending to put out new novels when we started. I'm going to apologize to you. No microphone has ever been friendly to me, so if I don't do this well. Are you all able to hear me? Great. Um, it actually began in a moment of frustration when I wanted to sell some book that I couldn't buy from a publisher. And I said to Rob the words that have gotten me through life. I turned to him and I said, I really want to sell a copy of whatever it was. How hard can it be? <laughs> Which is, you know, honestly, if you really thought about the kind of risks that you were taking opening an independent business of any kind, well, today, I mean, who would do that this afternoon? I've, you know, Rob's already fallen downstairs at the Walters Museum and opened his head, and we met John Talton outside who told us the Dow was below 9,000. I don't, I can't really think of anything. <laughs> it's going to be that wonderful to say <laughs> just at the moment. But in any case, um, a press, doing a publishing company is an enormous venture in capital and in talent and all kinds of things. And it was never our intention to do that. We were just going to put a few neat books back in print. Rob, what was your reaction when Barbara asked, how hard could it be? It sounded like fun. <laughs> <laughs> what was your intent in, in publishing the press? Because you, you act as the publisher. You are, are the engine behind the business. Uh, what was my intent? Um, I love technology, and I love doing new things. I am sort of a, spent my life being a jack of all trades and a master of many. Uh, this was one that I didn't think I'd ever master, and I was m a lot more right than I thought. But um, I, I, I think that I, I completely agreed with Barbara that there were books that should, should have been available that weren't available, and we saw no reason. So getting them back into print, print on demand had just come into I existence, basically. And uh, we thought we could use that technology along with some computer skills and various tools that I already possessed uh, to get books back into print. And that's where we began. And also at this time, there was started to be the, what some people have said, the decline of the mid-list. And that authors that were well received that had niches, you know, in audiences, but if they weren't at the very top of the bestseller list, were being dropped or or having to reform, you know, restart their careers. Is that something else that you had in mind when you when not you really were then? I don't think it was quite as obvious then. I think if any of you have read Jonathan Karp's really fabulous article in I don't remember which New York newspaper, but you can find it online about the 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 blockbuster and the dynamics of major publishing today and how it has to sort of go in that direction. 
Um, it wasn't as clear when we started it that that, that, that was going to be true. The truth is, I think in part, um, when I first started the Poison Pen in 1989, we were kind of the gatekeepers. Customers would come in and we would, we would suggest to them new books, tell them about stuff they'd never heard of. We'd get excited unpacking the boxes. We'd go, oh look, you know, here's a new whatever it is. That dynamic has completely changed. We now have many inventory cards in our system at the Poison Pen where customers have ordered books that not only have not been published, but I know for a fact haven't even been written by the authors who have mentioned them on their website. People seem to have far too little to do, and so they're browsing about on the internet, and they will write us about books. I mean, we're constantly saying to each other, is there gonna be a new book by whatever? We go, no, and then we look, and the author will say, I'm thinking about writing whatever, and to a reader, see, that translates into a real book. And it's, it's true, so we are more customer driven, customer demand driven than before when we were really the gatekeepers and could tell people about it. I have a terrible feeling that part of my love for editing new manuscripts, finding new authors and publishing them is that that's the only way I can stay to a gatekeeper. If I'm doing it, nobody can be ahead of me because, you know, this book isn't going to get out if the author and I don't agree to it. Well, you know how that is. You and I have done that together, what, four times? Yes. Yes. And it was a delightful experience. <laughs> well, no blood was actually shed, which was the good part. <laughs> it was a delightful experience. Rob, you were... I think of Poison Pen Press, I mean, there are a number of, of good, small, independent presses, and that I think of Poison Pen as really a, among those who are at the front. Tell us a little bit about what you've learned running the press, what you wish you had known then that, that you know now. We don't have enough time. Um, you know, it, it is, it, to me, it is such an excitement every day. I. I absolutely love going into work. Uh, it partly because I enjoy the, the people that we get to work with, the books, the authors, I enjoy the marketing and trying to figure out what's going on in book distribution and what's going on uh, amongst the New York publishers. I, I think it's probably both an advantage and a terrific disadvantage that I did not come out of the New York publishing scene. I don't know what they're doing there. I never did know what they were doing there. Barbara knows. Barbara knows every single person in New York who's involved in mystery publishing and most other realms, certainly of fiction publishing. Um, I, 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 I guess I consider it a disadvantage in the sense, and, I, and I get, maybe I wish I, I knew a little bit more in that when people talk to me about books by other authors, that I haven't read, and I'm a very slow reader. Um, I've got to sort of look at them and say, I'm sorry, I don't know. But um, it's just, every day is such a pleasure to me. So, you know, what can I say? Let me talk to you both a, a, a moment about the business model for your business, because you mentioned that you were doing, you, you do have one, don't you? No, no that's, yeah, that's, well, that's the mystery right there. No, 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 we have a business model. No. We, we hope that we can make enough on each book to support the habit. And so far, we've been successful at doing that. We're not going to make a killing. We know that. But if we can make enough to do, you know, next year's printings and uh, operations, that's, that's the business model. Well, I was, th I was thinking a little bit more about your relationship with the authors um, from a business perspective. There has been a lot in the news lately about Vanguard, about Harper Studio, moving to a different model um, than large advances and, and, and that have to be earned out before any royalties are paid. And now they're doing what you and Barbara have done always, which is pay a very small advance. It's usually the same or nearly the same for every author. And then there's more of a profit sharing at the back end. And um, uh, do you think that this, I, and I guess I understand it makes sense from a business perspective. It was always curious to me to see why the big publishing houses would bet millions and millions of dollars on a book without really knowing is it going to hit or is it not going to hit. Do you think that this is going to become the norm? I, I don't know whether it's going to become the norm. I, we, we did feel at the onset that one of the real 
problems in publishing was um, the disproportionately large advances that a very few authors got and then small advances that, that some others did. And it, uh, that also, we thought, caused uh, contention amongst the authors. Uh, we, we really felt that, that all auth we would treat all of our authors the same. And that was, in a lot of respects, I think one of the best decisions we ever made. Uh, many agents don't particularly like to work with us, which that's okay. Uh, I mean, we're, we don't expect to be getting, you know, a, a brilliant brand new, the first shot at a brilliant brand new manuscript from a major New York agency. That's not going to happen, but that's okay because we're happy to look at it after everybody else has passed. Well, let me say something which I think is exciting, and since Carolyn Wall is sitting over here as living proof of it, um, I think that you're going to find that um, developing a lot of new authors and new talents is really going to come from small presses. Some of you may know that Vince Flynn, for example, published his first book on his own and was then published by Simon & Schuster. If you don't know about Brunon Brunonia Berry and The Lace Reader, she and her husband self-published as Flap Jacket Press. I bought a ton of it, and then Morrow bought it for a lot of money, um, making me look even better as the bookseller. You know, how did you know? They always say, well, how did I know? Because I liked it. It was a good book. Uh, and Carolyn, who published a book with us, we have sold her book to Random House, and we kept a license to print a 1,000 copies of it, so we would be the publisher of record. But she's, she's already moved off to a different place. Um, ironically, because I didn't think she wrote a mystery in the classic sense, um, but that's okay. It was, a, it was a book that I loved, and I was able to find enough crime in it to say to Rob, let's publish it. And he said, as he always says, okay. Right. And there we were. But I think you're going to see that more innovative work is going to come from small presses because we, just, we are just back from a tour of the Random House West Minster warehouse over here in Maryland. And they're looking at what, Rob, 40,000 books? And you can't, you can't really take the kind of risks when you have the kinds of costs on the table, the 900 people in the warehouse, you know, the inventory, all the rest of it, that you can do if you're a small company. Uh, you can be more nimble as a small company, and you can afford to look for new talent. And I think a huge role that we're going to play is going to be incubating new talent. Yeah, well, that, that, that was always our hope, was that we would get an author going. We might help an author begin the process of developing an audience, and that after they did two or three books with us, we could move them on to another house. That has happened very, very infrequently, unfortunately. But as a practical matter, there really are very few authors that, can, that, that do make a, a, a living in this business. Uh, that's, that's the reality. Uh, but, yeah. And then kind of playing on that, um, Barbara, you talked a little bit about, you know, the traditional publishing's reliance on some mega hits or some franchises, basically series, you know, in, in carrying the rest of their business. As an editor, um, and uh, do you think, do you have an opinion as to why it seems that the book business is particularly bad at identifying what books, what, what creative product will hit? It seems like in television and movies and other creative endeavors, they have a system in place that they pretty much know, you know, is, is a television series going to do well? Is a movie going to do well? It seems that publishing perhaps is still of the let's throw a lot of money in terms of advances and, and hope one of them hits. Yeah, but you know, part of the fun of publishing is the sheer variety. I mean, one of the things that I love the best is, is something different. And when you're being, when it's that quirky, there isn't really any way to, to predict it. Publishing, to a great degree, I'll refer you back to Jonathan's article today, major publishing, a lot of it's about building brands. For example, I can always tell when books first come into the bookstore, like a first novel, the title is huge and the author's name is generally small because it's not going to do any good for you to know who the author is. But by book three or four, what you see is a migration and it'll say vastly across the top of the book, John Sanford and 45 point type or something, and underneath it it could say book X or book 11, Lucas Dab Davenport, you know, went to Pittsburgh or something, and nobody cares because what's selling is is the name, John Sanford up there, and 
what the idea is to get visibility in an increasingly crowded marketplace is to establish a brand so that readers migrate to the author. If you think today, realize today, we are down to 1,700 independent bookstores from 4,800. 50 percent, more than 50 percent of the books sold today are sold at Costco and Walmart. How's that for depressing? And Sam's Club. Um, books have to sell themselves. The packaging matters more than it used to, a lot more than it used to. The author's name matters more than it used to. Do you know there are entire um, ghostwriting industries? I mean, I've try to say to people as the 26th Margaret Truman publishes or something, and I say, you don't seriously think she's ever written one of these, do you? And people go, oh yeah, I've been reading her for years. No, you haven't been. Um, increasingly, there's a whole industry of franchising. Clive Custler, who lives in Scottsdale, what are we up to, five co Clive Custler authors, but he's always completely straightforward about it. It took a long time to get Jim Patterson to agree to put other authors on the books. But you're seeing, in other words, franchise or brand industries within it where people will go for a recognizable thing. Stuart Woods is writing three books a year. Robert Parker's writing three books a year. Mr. Sanford's writing two books a year. You're seeing that kind of a movement. And part of that is because those guys are actually, by the more books they publish, the more they can crowd the rest of you off the shelf. Got it? Well, and isn't, though, the motivation of, say, the larger publishing houses in New York a little bit different? They have stockholders to, exactly. to uh, answer Listen, to. Listen, I'm not criticizing them. They are parts of large conglomerates. And one of the questions Rob and I debate every once in a while is how much longer can, you know, Rupert Murdoch afford HarperCollins? How much longer can any of these big conglomerates actually afford book publishers who are not necessarily making them a lot of money. And then what happens if that is true? A senior editor at Random House once told me that it used to be the expression in New York is if you wanted to make money, you went over to Wall Street. If you wanted to follow your passion, you went into the book publishing business. There wasn't that expectation that I think there is today, but since the, a lot of the publishers are owned by large conglomerates, that they behave more like a traditional business in terms of, of profits. That said, authors today, there are a lot more demands on them than traditionally. It used to be enough that an author, say, would have an editor almost for his or her writing life. They would be nurtured. They would understand that they had some smaller books and perhaps that would lead to a bigger book. Um, they lived on their advances. A lot of times, I know this would horrify you, they moved in with their editors. <laughs> Wow, is that why we have a guest room? Well, you know, <laughs> how different is it really than sports? I mean, when I was a kid growing up, I, you know, if you were a Cubs fan, you were, you know, you had a team and players for your lifetime, practically. Joe DiMaggio, how many teams did he play for? Now you can move in mid-season. I mean, how, what's that? You know, so I don't think that it's any different. People working in the industry need job advancement and upward mobility and all of those things. I mean, no matter what we say about it, it's perfectly okay that it's all this way. It's just that you need to allow for it. Well, books have always, I, I, when you think about it, books have only been around for a couple hundred years. I mean, there, there is this kind of almost aura of preciousness about them that they can't change. And now we see things like everything from print on demand to e-books to author blogs to blogs turning into books. Um, what are your expectations with respect to your, to your authors in terms of what they need to do for for advertising, do you want them to blog? Do you want them to do video trailers? What? Uh, I guess I'm asking you to put on both your editor hat and your bookseller hat. With respect Why don't to we that. ask Rob? Because actually, this is probably much more his question. Um, Barbara and I just got back from doing a program at the Library of Congress the day before yesterday. I think um, talking about books in the past and in the future, in the future of publishing. Uh, for those of you who are interested in um, the discussion that's going on on the web on this, I would refer you to a couple of resources. One is uh, uh, the digitallist.net with one L, and the other is futureofthebook.org. Uh, both are, are excellent resources. Um, I personally think that narrative fiction and specifically mystery, has a very long life as a printed book in the way that we're used to dealing with it. 
I also believe, though, that the book, if you talk across all publishing, um, is largely is tr changing tremendously. Uh, their uh, readers are becoming involved in the process of creating books. Authors and readers are interacting. Uh, there are blogs. There are uh, all these interactive things that are going on on the net. And the networked book is uh, is certainly becoming a reality. I do think that uh, that books, mystery fiction, will absolutely be migrating to. Uh, digital readers, the um, the, the Kindle, Kindle right. the Kindle, the Sony e-reader. These are the first generation. Kindle is sort of close. It, it's close to being the first e digital book to get it right, but there's a lot wrong with it. And by no means is Amazon locked down this market. But uh, certainly, there's. I think there's agreement in publishing that that it's not really a question of will books go to digital. But what will be the form? What will be the digital form that they're that they're? Well, then, Barbara, I have to ask you about uh, Kindle. Just out of curiosity, how, how many people here own a Kindle or an e-book reader? And I I love mine, with the exception that um, I can't tell how far it is to the end. I mean, you know how you're used to having that bookmark, and you think, well, can I stay up and read another chapter or two? And I can't tell, and it doesn't. When I see it sitting on my shelf, unlike a book. You don't look at the title and go, oh, yes, there was that story, um, uh, and gee, I really enjoyed reading it. So I understand those limitations, but at the same time, I love being able to carry around 40 books in my hand. There are good things and bad things about it. For one thing, the human eye is really not designed to read on the screen. Rob can tell you this. The human eye is not designed to read. Which way does it go, honey? The reflected? It, I, you it, uh, human eye is, is designed to look at reflected light and not illuminated light. One of the reasons the Kindle is sort of getting it right close is because, in fact, that is reflected light. It's using digital ink as opposed to light that's coming at you, like, from an LCD screen, a monitor. Right. So for one thing, you can just get tired. Then there are all kinds of things. A lot of it depends on what a sophisticated user you are. I haven't figured out how to take notes on it or even move backward and forward with any success. So um, it's going to take people who are, are more comfortable with that. One of the things that, that you know, there's a huge tacit assumption under all of this that the world is going to have an infinite and uninterrupted supply of electricity or batteries. You know, we just had a hurricane. How many people in Galveston are reading on their computers? I mean, come on. You know, a lot of this stuff sounds absolutely wonderful for the digerati and all, but in the end, there are a lot of times when something more old-fashioned is just going to work better for you. Um, but book, you need a light to read your book by. Well, you can have a candle. Come on. Um, you know, book publishing I'm is, turning in my next manuscript in quill mm, and ink, mm, obviously. All right. There, there, are, there are good things about a Kindle, but I have discovered recently, I've been saying to my customers, we can no longer afford to send you our 48-page, 40,000-word, my life work, you know, 10 days every month goes into this because the post office is just destroying them in their wonderful machines, which is the way they now read and deliver stuff. And you keep moving and forgetting to tell us where you are, so blah, blah, blah. And many of them have said, well, you're just trying to transfer the cost, you know, so you'll send it to us by email. We'll have to print it out to read it. And I say, no, 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 no. The idea is you're going to read it on the screen. And they reject that. But anyway, we did a poll, and out of these like 10,000 people, 30% of them don't even have computers. It was my customer base. And I said, wow, there's a real revelation. We all assume, you know, people in New York and publishing and all, that the whole world has moved digital, and it hasn't. There's a, there's a lot of, what is it, the long tail, whatever it is going on. So I think what we're going to see is a gradual migration, people who get more comfortable with it, kids who are going to be happy with it, you know, because they sort of grew up with it. But do I think the book is going to become extinct? No. Do I think that this author-reader narrative, the 39 Clues model, the War of the Worlds model, the gamer thing, is going to take over everybody. No, I haven't yet met a mystery writer who was interested in anyone's assistance with their plotting. 
Every author I know wants to be the god in his or her own book. That's one reason they write them. But at the same time, they are also authors are putting their characters into Second Life. You know, the characters are blogging. They're, they are being that, a little bit more interactive. It certainly could be. There's a very good discussion Tess Gerritsen and I had. If you go to poisonedpen.com, it's P-O-I-S-O-N-E-D-P-E-N, um, we just did a video trailer, an hour video trailer, Rob did, of Tess and me uh, last Saturday. And we have a discussion about that, and one of her big concerns is can she remain alive as a published writer if digital takes over? If the music industry model is what happens to publishing, how are authors going to get paid for their work? Is copyright a dead, a dead idea? Rob has some really good ideas about how that might go. And Rob, in your, in your answer, talk about things that I think concern a lot of writers. For example, Amazon's Search Inside the Book, or Google's uh, Book Search, or, uh, I mean, because piracy as well as, uh, as uh, denigration of copyright, is all, those are all concerns. Well, uh, I think that a lot of you would not like to hear all my thoughts on this. <laughs> um, I, I frankly think that over the next 10 to 20 years, we're going to see significant changes in the model in which authors, creators of material get compensated. Um, I think that there are significant problems with digital rights management, and I think that the copyright, uh, as it has been applied in the past, is has got some significant problems. Um, that's not to say that I don't think that authors should be protected and paid, but you mean it uh, shouldn't be. Sorry, shouldn't be. Excuse me. Yeah, no, I, 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 I do think that you all should be protected and paid. <laughs> I can see panic overcoming many people. <laughs> don't abandon my ship, please. <laughs> the poison no. pen authors are filing out of the rear of the room. Yeah. <laughs> No, uh, but, but, I, but I think that, and, and frankly, I think that Poison Pen Press has actually sort of been good in this respect because I, I, I believe that it's the content, what you're creating, that really matters a lot. And getting that used in, 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 in many forms and getting paid for it from a lot of different forms is the direction, well, it's one of the directions that I, I sort of envision this moving. I am not a futurist. I, I've got some ideas. I try to read about it a little bit. Well, I have a, especially, we have a generation that's largely, I think, under 30 that grew up, you know, reading everything on screens and texting and all that. And they even say there's been some studies that have done that they read differently than people over 30. They do what is called power browsing. Um, they read vertically, not horizontally. They go down and they're looking for the gist. It's how they read web pages. It's how they look at videos. It's how, you know, they sample through when, especially men, do that annoying thing with the remote control in the TV. And it's not just impatience. It's they don't have the capacity to do what all of us have done is settle into a book or immerse themselves into a book. It's um, and I think that that was once taken for granted by writers that that's how their readers would interact. And now young people with the advent of social networking, um, they're very used to responding, to being part of the process or part of the experience. And I'm wondering if down the road, if you think authors or writers are going to have to adapt to that. In other words, they're going to have to expand their creative output beyond making quote unquote just a book. If it's also going to have to require anything from a variety of a video game to a blog to, to uh, interaction with people as they're actually writing the work in process. Do you see that happening, Rob? Well, I, I, th I do think, I, I think that the blogging and all these other efforts are, are worthwhile in the sense of he helping interact with the readers, the people that hopefully are going to pick up your material, your book, and, and view it. And I think that from a marketing s standpoint, uh, these are certainly useful endeavors. Obviously, they take away from the time of writing. Uh, 
you know, there are the, there's, there's no reason. The fact of the matter is that the technology exists today that every single person in this room could go out there and publish their own book. So you, you don't need me. You know, I mean, you can, you can do that on your own. Of course, you may not have time to write the book that you publish. That's, that's a, a problem that exists. And you may not be able to, to market it as effectively, and you may not be able to get the distribution. And there are other things that, that, that go on. Well, I think it's even more complicated than that. The more stuff that's piling out there, the more you need screens to help you figure out what's worthwhile. I mean, you know, probably everybody in here at some point or other has tried Google. What do you get from Google? I mean, you get all this stuff. And does it in, how useful is it for you? Google, I think, is working right now on better Google. Um, I mean, let's remember that all innovation builds on existing technology. Until there were computers, there couldn't be space travel. Until there was a wine press, Mr. Gutenberg couldn't actually make a book with that cool, movable type. It only works because he took a wine press and created a printing press. It's always been like that. We can't tell at the rate the technology is changing what will be available. When I opened the bookstore, Rob brought over a fax machine on day three and plugged it in. This is in 1989, and he said, you might use this. And I'm thinking, lunch, right? We're going to fax the pizza place for lunch. And before I turned around, we, it was totally filled with international fax numbers, because Scottsdale is a, is a major international tourist destination. And we have Japanese customers, we have German customers, we have customers from all over the world, and we faxed them. And then what happened? One of these days, you know, along came the internet, all this other stuff. We wore bricks, clicks, and catalogs before anybody else ever thought of it. But it was a natural migration. What's going to happen with all of this technology in a few years from now? Right now, it takes a lot of money to design a game. But maybe everybody can have their own War of the Worlds. Do you know how that works? They pay, what is it, Rob, $15 a month? And there are millions of subscribers? Wouldn't you like to be the guy that wrote War of the Worlds? It's, it's, it's World of War, I think, Sorry. that Barbara's referring to. I'm thinking of H.G. Wells, yeah. right. Oh, well, what could I say? But seriously, I mean, I don't think we can tell what's going to happen because we can't actually even see the technology that may come along that will make it happen. As a publisher, Poison Pen Press, are you moving into that? Are, you, are all the titles available as e-books? Are they available on MP3? Are you starting to ask more things of your authors? I mean, it used to be traditionally you did book tours, an ad in the New York Times book review section was considered great, et cetera. I guess it's a two-part question. Um, Rob, tell us a little bit about where you see the press going with all these things. And then, Barbara, if, even from a bookseller point of view, if you could talk a little bit about you know, if, if the book tour is dead and, and what have you, what's next on don't the horizon? Even, don't even think that. That is such an ugly thing to say. Um, one of the things that we did last year was that we struck a deal with Blackstone Audio to do audio books of basically all the forthcoming books. So we, we, have, we have done large type editions concurrently with our regular print editions. Uh, typically we'll do a hardcover, uh, a large type edition at the same time and then a year later do a trade paperback of that same book when we do the next book in series. Uh, about a year ago, I struck a deal with Blackstone to do audio books of our forthcoming books. Small advances, but primarily royalties. I mean, we're working with Blackstone in the same way that we work with our authors. Um, and I think that that is, it's not, it's not that we are going to make or our authors are going to make a great deal of money, but they'll make a little bit more, it will be incremental, and there will be that many more people that will be exposed to that author. Um, we have put out about a dozen Kindle and Sony e-reader editions. Uh, those have typically been books, and, and, and in fact in the foreseeable future will only be books, that for all practical purposes booksellers are ignoring today. That is, they're, they're three years, four years, five years post-publication, and they're, they're very, very deep backlist. We might sell two or three copies a year, whatever it is. I refuse to compete with independent booksellers. I'm not willing to give Amazon an advantage over the poison pen or, you know, murder I by the book. 
Well, or, or, or any, any bookstore, because I really feel strongly that the, the, that the books, the bookstores, I want to sell books, and I want the bookstores to be able to do that. But at the same time, a book, I think that there is a demand for electronic books, although, like I say, the Kindle is the first to sort of get it right, and we'll be getting more books out there in that form, but it's, it's a slow process, and not something that I'm going to be putting out. I will not be p publishing Kindle editions of a new book at the same time. That's, I, I think that that's counterproductive. So your Bar question was about the bookstore? Yeah, why, why, um, why, why have an independent the, why bookstore? Isn't the book, or why isn't the book tour dead? Well, it, there are a lot of reasons for it. I mean, I think the central question is why have, why have a bookstore at all? Um, and there are a couple things that I think are going on that I've been thinking about it considerably because, I mean, my customers refer to us as me as the volunteer bookstore owner. In fact, if I had two things that I would do over again in the 20 years that I've been owning the Poison Pen, the first is I would have bought a building, but it was, it was going to be a hobby, so I didn't think owning real estate was really going to be a great idea. And Rob really didn't want to own real estate, so we didn't do that. And the other thing is I would actually pay myself a salary instead of giving it all to my staff because they don't make enough money and they need health insurance because the problem is if I want to move out, there isn't any money to replace me. I've created a huge problem. So now what? But assuming that we keep, well, but there are two things that I think are happening that, that may change the whole shape of the bookstore. Since you can buy the actual physical product for a different price in a whole bunch of locations, why would you come into the Poison Pen or the Mystery Bookstore or Murder by the Book or whatever and pay full price for a book? There are several reasons. One is that if we have read the books, we are more likely to sell you a book that you're going to like because whenever any one person comes into the store, and librarians speak, this is called the reference interview, and they say, sell me a good book, every answer is different. Every single person is different. You have to find some way to do that. All of the video trailers, television ads, all that stuff might drive you to a few brand names, but they aren't going to tell you about something more unusual or something that specifically fits you. So the screening process, the more stuff that's published, the more you need somebody to help you figure out what's the right book for you. And the other is the more people are online and sitting home in their jammies going to work or you know looking up stuff and all, Human nature is much more social than that. And the more I think people need a sense of community. So, I mean, I don't think of, of my bookstore as a bookstore. I think of it as a community theater or a gathering place. And without exception, at every event when people come in, I hold up the book and I say, welcome to another evening at the Poison Pen, and here's your ticket. And if you don't buy it, the author has no reason to come back. And actually, I have no reason to be here so if this is something you enjoy and you want to continue, support us by purchasing books. It's really worked out very well. And people seldom throw them at me anymore or try to hit me with baby strollers or things that used to happen when I said to them, you have to buy the book to get it signed here. I think that we're going to see more of that. I think that Facebook and MySpace and all of these social networking sites are, in fact, a way to create communities, not necessarily people who are geographically contiguous, but to have something you know, to talk about. And I had a woman at Tess Gerritsen signing who came t up to me and she said, oh, have you been on Facebook and seen what everybody has to say about K Tess's book that we just did the event for? I said, actually, no. And she said, well, I'm all excited and I'm gonna rush home and see what all my friends had to say. Meaning maybe she needed that reassurance before she'd buy it or maybe she just wanted to validate what had happened or she really wanted to talk about it. Book clubs are actually on the ascendant because it gives people something to gather up and, you know, together and talk about. And I think that bookstores can fill that function too. But the critical question is how can we make that pay? If people are coming in, what is it that is paying the light bill? And I think that's the publishing, the, the whole question for publishers, for magazines, newspapers, bookstores, whatever. How is the content going to be delivered? Question one. Question two, how are you going to find it? In library speak, how do you retrieve it? Um, editorial, whatever it is, the critical function. 
And the third one is, how's everybody going to make it pay? What are libraries doing to make themselves survive? And I think all these questions are in such flux. Well, also, I guess there's been some talk about, say, for example, an entity such as Amazon cutting out the publisher altogether. That they could, Amazon, for example, could directly engage with authors and, and cut out the middlemen. You know, they, the agent, the publisher, those would all be obsolete. And so that would free up 30 to 40% of the pie, which Amazon would then split with the author. Uh, Rob, what do you think the prospects of that happening down the road? What are your thoughts on that? I, I wouldn't be surprised if they try. Uh, I'm not, I, readers are going to have to make a decision about who is providing the kinds of books that they want to read. The problem, obviously, is who, who, who are the filters? What are the filters? Who do you trust? Uh, you used to trust the New York Times book review. You used to trust the you know, Washington Post book review or the various, the various uh, reviewers in, the, in, in mainstream media or on television. I mean, those people, of course, the newspapers are cutting back coverage dramatically. Uh, so you're getting online reviewers. And, and who amongst those online reviewers do you trust? Uh, the, the existence of the book on Amazon, Amazon can perhaps market it better, but Amazon can only do so much. I, I really don't spend a lot of time worrying about what other people are going to do. We're going we're to continue to do what we do as long as we can afford to do it. And if we can't, then too bad. I'm sorry, but we'll give it the best shot. Well, I mentioned those two filters because those are two things that Amazon doesn't actually provide. But, I mean, I'm not opposed to Amazon. There's zillions of people out there who don't want to talk to anybody about a book. or You know, they just want something to fix their Volkswagen or, you know, how to can cucumbers or something. And there are all kinds of weird. I mean, fiction is an extremely small part of publishing. It's only 25%. There's a universe of books out there that don't need anything that I do or anything that Rob well, also, does. Also, Amazon does have a little bit of a community because of the reader reviews. If you want to fix your Volkswagen, you go and you read the reviews, and if somebody says this is a good book or this is a bad book, you you know people. Well, sure, do but that's not any different that. than TripAdvisor, and right. you know if they think it was a great meal at the restaurant in Venice, and you go there and it's inedible. I mean, everybody's palate's different too, right? So I mean, you can't necessarily just because somebody said I had a terrific experience at the Hotel Bella Vista or something, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have a great experience there. I think there's room for everybody, but as I said, the real question is how, how is it going to be made to pay so that a business can stay in business? Then in light of that, in addition to writing a, the very best book they possibly can, what else are you asking of your authors now and what do you anticipate? Do you ask them to participate in blogs? Do you ask them to tour? What would your... It, advice be to, to an author who wants to promote? We don't make demands of our authors. We try to help them. Uh, we basically, one of, the thi one of the things that's worked very well for us is we've put all of our authors together. Uh, we've got a, a very active author e-group and there's a tremendous amount of common experience and knowledge I think that has helped all of that helps all of our new authors and that I think has, has helped many of our existing authors and as a consequence they've been able to do joint events and whether it be libraries or bookstores uh, they've been able to uh, as, as a small press we have very very limited funds available we're we help where we can. We make posters available. Uh, we, get, we do a fairly good job, I think, of getting advanced reading copies out. Um, and we've been quite successful, happily, in getting you know, reviews over the years. And that, and that certainly helped us enormously. What do I recommend to authors? If they're comfortable getting out there and building a community and, and developing a readership, then, then that's exactly what we'd like to see them do. Uh, at, from a bookseller perspective, in your opinion, what what is effective author promotion? What when you because you have probably what three hundred author events a year, mm -hmm. and what what works? It just 
you never know for sure, but showing up is probably the thing that works the best, and that's why I say I don't think the author tour is dead. There is a serendipity that comes from physically being in a place that is unpredictable, and I've never, almost never had an author come to the store where something something didn't happen that neither the author nor I could anticipate in terms of either the people that came or you know, something that went on. It also works as a paid advertising campaign. If you're in a community where your bookstore can advertise in community, not advertise, but has a book calendar. If you have a website, if you have your own newsletter and whatever it is, an author doing a, an event is more visible because there are more channels for promoting the event and, and you can be more obscure if you're in the regular list. I also think, again, it's this whole thing about customer interaction. It's not, if you're not there, you can't talk to them. So authors, I think, are really well advised to hook up with other authors and if possible, try to do almost like theater, go around with somebody. If your publisher is not underwriting, if two or three of you share expenses, it works out really well. Whatever you know, you feel that you can put the time and energy into, I think is great. I, I hope that the author tour isn't dead. I know it's been cut back in a lot of instances, but unfortunately the kind of thinking that's led to that it drives, it's a different dynamic. It may sell as many books in a chain bookstore. It's not gonna help independence. I'm actually gonna try the effect. I feel sure it's coming right up um, since cash flow is diminishing dramatically at the moment where I'm gonna have to say to some New York customers, you know what, this is the best we can do. And if it's not working, Bye. And if we're not important enough to them or to our customers, we don't have any reason to be there. I've had 20 great years. I'm not going to be unhappy about it at all. But I think we're getting towards hardball time in this economy when we all have to make decisions about how it's going to go, and I'll be interested. I don't think it's a good idea for all independent bookstores to fade away because we can do some good things that other retail no, outlets like can do. Censorship in a way. I mean, if you're carrying authors that aren't in the mainstream bookstores, if you're promoting writers that otherwise wouldn't we be We can heard. make more noise in a, lot of, in a lot of senses. So I think this is gonna be a really challenging year to find out. But you know what, we've hadn't said a word about mystery here. We're talking about other stuff and I'll bet some of you have questions about the genre or whatever. So maybe this would be a great time just Absolutely. to ask questions. Anybody got any? Or if we stunned you into Stun silence. Them into mm -hmm. silence. Mm -hmm. I see a hand. Could you stand, yes. sir, so we could hear you? It's not going to happen to us. I mean, w we probably get a thousand submissions a year, roughly, and in a good year, we'll find five that we're able to, you know, that we think are are worth publishing. It's not not even a question of being worth publishing. I shouldn't I shouldn't you put mean it that five way. Five new voices. Yeah, five 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 new voices that 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 we are going to publish, and it's not a question of worth because. It may be that we get one that is worth publishing, but that we have just ac accepted a, another manuscript that is in the same vein, that is very similar. Uh, there's, as Barbara will tell you, there's a tremendous tendency for some reason that all of a sudden some subject becomes hot. And I don't know whether it's a virus that flows through the air. Uh, but, but, you know, you'll get 40 books, and it's not just the success of one Da Vinci Code that will bring that on. Um, so, you know, yeah, if, if, but, but certainly big publishing, um, if they're looking at it from the standpoint of, of making a lot of money, uh, they're, they're, they're going to have to, you know, they, 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 in an ideal world, they would publish three books a year, each of which selling 100 million copies. Barbara, let me ask you about the mystery world, and what do you see as trends? What do you see as, as the future? 
for, for mystery, for genre writers. God, it's just such a neat subject. Um, I think, I, the more I think about it, the more I think that genres go through cycles and they're roughly a generational thing or 20 years. When I opened the bookstore in 1989, the historical novel was totally dead. I could not find a single historical novel that I liked that I could sell, including like Catherine by Anya Seton or some of the classics. And there was a big migration of people who had written historical fiction into mysteries, because how hard was it? Somebody dies, right? You're doing history. So it, it was really fairly simple. And today, the hottest genre out there in, in literature is you know, it's like a whole Tudor industry, right? I mean, bless Philippa, but nevertheless, it's going on. And the historical novel has become hugely hot, and so the historical mystery is becoming increasingly rare. What you're getting, in fact, is now the Da Vinci Code model, which is you have a window in the present, so you grab all the people who want to read contemporary thrillers, and then you look at the past, and you have a whole past story flowing underneath in other centuries or something, doesn't really matter, while they're chasing a document or an artifact or you know digging up Tibet or whatever it is that's happening in the present. So you've got a kind of hybrid historical novel going on. Romance writers migrated into mystery, so you're getting a lot of romantic suspense. I've always loved romantic suspense. I was reading Mary Stewart and Phyllis Whitney. Rob and I had tea with the single greatest asset I've ever had as a bookseller is a woman named Elizabeth Peters, Barbara Michaels, Barbara Mertz, because many people think that I actually write her great Egyptian <laughs> mysteries. And we refer to each other with great affection as that other Barbara when we're together. And we had a wonderful tea yesterday from which I can now tell you she has a white cat named Gandalf, a deaf white cat named Gandalf, fabulous. But in any case, where was I going? I had something I was... Oh, romantic suspense, right. Um, that she wrote absolutely tons of romantic suspense and, in fact, is still writing romantic suspense. And she was telling us that Phyllis Whitney, who died at 104 fairly recently, was writing those books up into her 90s. You've got the whole what if, the whole Mary Roberts Reinhardt, you know, that kind of book, The Woman in Jeopardy, If Only I'd Known, you know, that kind of thing never really goes away. The thing that has really come back strongly in crime fiction is noir, which is not hard-boiled. There is a difference because noir is, doesn't necessarily have a happy ending. In fact, it's called noir because seldom does it really have a happy ending. You're screwed on the first page and then it gets worse. Yeah, it's you're, a downward. You're screwed on the first page and then it gets worse. Yeah, it's Patricia Highsmith. It's yeah. James M. Cain. It's kind of a downward cycle spiral, sorry. But the point is that this stuff rises and falls. Right now we have this huge paranormal craze. You know what it is? It's eroticism. I mean, vampire books are basically soft porn, or more so, depending on the author's own, um, I don't read it, so I don't know just to what degree we've gone, but it'll fade because what happens is so many people rush into whatever that hot number is that it gets boring. And people go, oh, God, you know, I mean, I've read all this, and some of it is so bad that people turn off, and then there'll be the next new thing. And here's where the ringer goes. Nobody ever knows what the next good thing will be, next new thing will be, until it's happened. And then everybody rushes to jump on that train. It's already left the station. So you're now trying to write for something that happened. My best advice to all writers is write what you love because you could be that train. It, you, you can't do it. And for readers, trust yourself. You don't need to like books that your friends like. You don't need to like the books that are best on the New York Times. I have sold books for 20 years on this basis. If you pick it out, you can't bring it back. If I sold it to you and said you'd like it, you can return it. I hardly ever get any books back. Maybe they're too scared. But at the same time, I'm really serious about that. You should trust yourself. And if it's not a book you're liking, don't finish it. Throw it away. Give it to the library. We have time for one more question in the back. Hi, Daphne. Well, it's going to be really bad news for financial thrillers, um, but 
I, I was really chortling because I was right before we came, I'd leaf through my, my penguin, my big penguin hardcover catalog, and you know what their lead title for this fall is? The History of Goldman Sachs, and what an absolutely brilliant company it is. And I'm thinking, whoops, <laughs> it's too late. Um, I think that actually reading books is going to go up in hard times. It did during the Depression. Many of the practices we currently see, the mass market paperback, the books on consignment that can be returned were all ways to help people read books during the Depression when there was less money. It is cheaper than other forms of entertainment. It lasts longer, and books don't get used up. When you read it, you can pass it on to somebody else. If the question is, will there be more cozies and feel goods? I don't know. Look at the movies during the Depression. What did we have? Fred and Ginger? And, you know, I think that you're right. When times are dire, people look for something that is relief, that is escape. And so, indeed, more cozies, happier books may be the result of, of that. But I do think that reading will go up as a consequence of what's currently going on because it's still the best value you can get for your time and your money. And if your lights go out, you can buy a candle. Barbara and Rob, thank you very, very much for your time. Um, of course, they will be here all weekend. Our, they're both very approachable, even Barbara. And, <laughs> And one other thing, if you are interested in a really much more serious discussion of, of a lot of the things we've talked about, go to the Library of Congress website. They videocast the hour that Rob and I did at the library Tuesday night. Their actual website is loc.org. No. No, G-O-V? G-O-V. G-O-V, sorry. LOC.gov, loc.gov, and under the center for the book, you can see um, in fact, all of the talks at the National Book Festival, which were a week ago Saturday, but also Rob's and, and my talk. Yeah, I, I don't think it's up there quite yet, but, but, but at any rate, loc.gov is where you can get to it. Thank you very much, everyone.